sonicstate.com. That's right. You've caught me listening to some low-frequency waveforms. Welcome to my state-of-the-art sonic laboratory. I love synthesizers. Arps, Oberheims, Moogs, even crappy old German PPGs. I love them all. But I'm not talking about the love that a man has for a well-made piece of furniture or a fine wine. I'm talking about deep carnal lust. Gear lust, if you will. And just as any embittered aging Lothario speaks of past loves, so tonight, I will lead you by the hand and take you through some of the finest synthesizers ever made. That's right, it's the top 20 synths of all time, ever. Here's the Selena. The sound of this string ensemble keyboard became as synonymous with 70s discos as Rehypno has become in many of today's chain pubs. A lot of the famous Cure sounds came from a Selena string machine and we never took that on stage, I sampled that into May 4 and before that it was sampled into uh, Prophet 2000. Probably the first time I heard that was Herbie Hancock using it as those, you know, he'd, he'd do like you know, on the Headhunters uh, era, there'd be like a big funky groove and then, uh, then they'd space out and he'd do a big road solo and then the strings would come in and they sound incredible. This is definitely being my top five most important keyboards of all time. It's kind of average until you hit the modulation and they had like a three-tier chorus or something like that that you never hear it quite resolve and it's the most beautiful modulation. It's Dreamweaver, that song Dreamweaver, it's every string sound on that. It's all over uh, heroes and low. It fills such a great space. It was a great sound and quite difficult to sample. Um, so in the studio we'd always use the real thick. But every tour we're like, let's try, and let's try and get a better sample out of it this time. In the end I gave up and I just used the uh, synth string sound on the XP50 to it sounded similar. You know. You're watching SonicState.com. Piltdown Man, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, all rare animals, but none quite as rare as the white version of the next synthesizer on our list, the Roland SH-101. Normally available in grey, blue and red, the ultra-rare white version of this synthesizer has entered electronic folklore. Chemical Brothers, Prodigy, Aphex Twin, 808 State, Future Sound of London, Orbital, everybody used a 101. I think it was a real kind of rock star keyboard in a lot of respects because you could strap it on and sort of play it like a guitar and sort of pose around with it. Which was kind of bizarre really because the sort of sounds it was creating were much more suitable for kind of studio based recordings. You get that amazing sort of rock solid rubbery sort of bass sound that would fill out the bottom end of your track but it could also do the kind of squidgy lines the sort of acidy lines over the top so in some respects it was a very dynamic keyboard well the disadvantages were no memory and no midi although you can get retrofits and so on i think the 101 was about as funky and sexy as roland ever got you're watching sonicstate.com
One of the first bands to use synths on stage were legendary 70s space rockers Hawkwind. A lot of people didn't know what synth they used because they were too distracted by the charms of Starcia, the exotic dancer that Hawkwind used in their shows. Tragically, Starcia left Hawkwind in 1975 to become a deputy headmistress at a school in Hamburg. Apparently her assemblies are awesome. Here's the VCS3. I think the no keyboard thing, I quite like that, you see, because straight away it takes you somewhere else. It takes you away from the idea that you're going to play some kind of synth lead or you're going to use it for a bass part or any of those things. You know, you, you, you've just got a button that you push. It makes whatever noise it's going to make when you trigger it with that. And that's a very different way of thinking about, you know, making a, a musical contribution from a synthesizer. And I think it, it kind of gives you a much uh, less friendly environment to work with and then it confronts you with the, you know, the, 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 the electronics kind of much more upfront way. The oscillators sound lovely and the filter sounds lovely and the reverb's really clanky and hissy and brilliant. And um, as soon as you put it on a recording, which we're doing a lot at the moment, um, it just sounds like a record immediately. It has a really lo-fi sound about it. I mean, it immediately sounds glued into the track. I remember being my grannies and seeing like Doctor Who and stuff and the Dalek voice on um, Doctor Who was the VCS3 ring modulator. Loads of eye dents on television and radio and stuff were done by the Radiophonic Workshop, often with VCS3. Fantastic sound, incredible noise. The modulation possibilities are absolutely enormous. You can send things back into themselves because it has this great big routing pin matrix. It has a joystick, which is a, just a brilliant con controller. There's not many synths, old synths have that on. Um, and you can patch that to three or four different things. So wherever you move it, lots of stuff is moving. I mean, it's the sort of thing we get in software quite a lot now with, with pads and virtual pads or, you know, uh, where you, it's a brilliant idea of sending modulation stuff all over the place just by tiny movements. David Vorhaus's first um, record, Electric Storm, there's VCS3 all over that. It's totally brilliant. Brilliant programming. I think that's lots of ch chopped up tape, so I reckon they would have made sounds, little arpeggios and things, and then put them together in, uh, uh, on tape. A lot of people use them now in studios as a piece of outboard and just send drum kits through um, the filter not to sweep it or anything, but just to give it a kind of slightly crunchy sound. If you put sounds through it, it's like just giving them a lovely sepia tint. You know, it, whatever you put into it, it suddenly just goes, ah, oh, 1969. It's just kind of slightly broken and uh, rather beautiful. That's it for now. Join us next time as we continue our countdown of the 20 greatest synths of all time ever. Well, they're robust. They're made out of wood metal and all that, but they don't like being lugged around too much. They're pretty reliable. We, we might yet build a, a more modern version of that. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes the X7 sooner. Sonic State. Dot com.